say, uh, first of all, can you hear me, Raphael? Great to have you, and thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Sorry for the delay there. I'm, I'm actually traveling right now with some relatives, so um, kind of have to just jump in. Like no, hundred percent, whatever 100%. I have. So um, whatever Brody, we got to do. Whatever we got to do, whatever way, whatever way it goes, we get it done. It doesn't matter. It's about getting the signal out. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity. And I've been prepping this all week. And I just want to say this uh, from another uh, idol of mine who quite says, Bernardo Faris, another jiu-jitsu practitioner. When he meets another uh, professor of jiu-jitsu, he says, it's a huge honor for me. And this to me, uh, this interview and meeting yourself is a huge honor for me as well, because I've been following your Odyssey, I'm, I, I'm off YouTube. We were deleted off YouTube for medical misinformation, unfortunately, speaking too much of the truth. But part of that very important message, as you can see above your head there, was trying to relay the importance of privacy coins and the cryptocurrency world. Um, and uh, during that first part of the, uh, before you were due to come on there, I wanted to play a little interaction that I had with one of my followers here. And I've been speaking and advocacy, advocating about privacy coins, talking about, as we say, Austrian economics, the utility, the fungibility, all of the philosophical aspects as well, which is I'm very enthralled to bring you to my audience and our little part of the world here in the Republic of Ireland, because you are an early adopter. You have been involved in the cryptocurrency world, the Bitcoin world, near enough from its inception. You move among the great whales themselves and you have a phenomenal team in the Crypto Vigilante, along with the Dollar Vigilante, uh, which I am subscribed to, obviously, and I've got the, the latest the latest uh, technology that we've advocated for. And it is uh, something that I push on to my subscribers. But the conversation briefly was that I explained not only the utility, the fungibility of these privacy kinds, decentralized exchange, all this new technology that's coming on. But uh, I was saying to her that everything I learned, I've learned from you by following, listening to your advocacy for BSV, for privacy kinds and but listening to your various um um conferences that you've been attending to from screaming out in the middle of the uh, las vegas and talking about if you ain't got privacy kind you ain't got shit so i'd love for you and i'm going to step very much out of the way Raphael, and let you please just uh, uh explain to people the the, the fungibility aspects cryptocurrency as a tool for anarcho-capitalism ultimate privacy with ultimate capitalism and the the philosophy behind it and how we can use it to our advantage in the years coming forward. So um, pretty much, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, uh, thank you for everyone that's listening and taking the time to uh, talk about these things that are so important to everyone. Uh, these things are important because we are moving into um, a, a world where we have to make decisions. Uh, decisions as to whether we're going to put up with tyranny on a global scale like we've never seen before or whether we're actually going to live like decent people. And the, the, the philosophy of anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism in general, is nothing more than the, uh, the worldview of, of decency, being a decent person, right? That, um, like the Greeks would say, you know, it, it does not matter if the law is in place or not. People that are unethical are going to act unethical whether there are laws in place or not. People that are virtuous and ethical are going to act correctly, no matter what the law says. So we have before us a brand new asset class that allows us many different opportunities. And if you think, for your, think of this as a new set of uh, tools, for you to use, oh uh, well, it, it, it beckons that you really come to understand these from their fundamental perspective as to what they afford to you as an individual. Um, there's so much to talk about that I would much rather have you ask me direct questions because I, I can talk about this forever. Really, I, I, I just absolutely, what I, what I, yeah, yeah. What I really want to say is is that. Um, Everyone in their own personal lives right now is, uh, it seems to me like everyone that's in the know is preparing for what is to come, what's already upon us. And my mentor and, and business partner, Jeff Berwick, a lot of people have been like, where is he? Why is he not, do why is he not doing as many walk and talks as he used to? And well, it's because he's preparing as well, you know, in his personal life. Um, a lot of the team that we work with is also preparing. We, we understand what we're up against. We understand that, that um, 
we're going to be seeing a lot of shifts in the world. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's also time to get right spiritually, right? Because we can talk about assets, we can talk about technology, we can talk about economics, but it's also about getting right within you, you know, in, as, as an individual, get right with everyone around you. And, and, and um, I, I just want to throw this out there because most people are, are very, especially people that, that are attracted to what we do, are very generous people. And, and I know that their knee-jerk reaction will more than likely be very similar to my knee-jerk reaction, which is to help others prepare. And that's what I do, right? That's what we do. We, we teach people. But in my personal life, I've been going out of my way, helping people out so much, trying to help them prepare that I'm, I'm actually pulling back from that and just focusing on, now this is really time to prepare for myself and, and those who are close around me. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, I know it sounds cliche, but it, it, it never hurts to be said, right? Make sure you are taking care of yourself first because people right now, you, you might reach out and you might try to tell people to prepare, but they won't listen and you will waste your time. And so the best thing to do is for you to prepare right now in your personal life because the time will come when they will knock on your door when they're in need. Because when these things happen, they happen pretty much overnight. When, when, when the, an economy collapses, it happens overnight. When there is a communist revolution, it happens overnight. And people find themselves having to go on bank runs, realize that they have no access to their money, or they find themselves having to leave their country with whatever they're wearing. And I've seen this over and over again, you know, in my own family, I've seen it. You know, I have family members that left Cuba. I've left, I know people that are close to my family that left Chile under those same, same circumstances. I have um, extended family that left Hungary as well um, during the revolution of 56. So when these things happen, they happen and, and, and they will catch you off guard and they'll catch most people off guard. So even for us that are quote unquote in the know, it's important for us to realize that this is game time. We need to focus right now on taking care of ourselves, of our close ones, to take care of what we need in our personal lives because the time will come and it is approaching right now where people are going to need your help. And I'll, I'll give you an example right now. Um, I'm getting a lot of uh, mail and messages from people in Australia that are asking me and asking others around me to, to help them leave Australia. I, I'm not Australian. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know Australia that well. You know your country better than I do. I mean, so the best thing that I could do is just, hey, you know, there's someone that finds themselves with similar desires in your country. You know, maybe you guys should team up and maybe, you know, so I find myself making, bringing people together but yeah, like right now in Australia, people are wanting to leave and they can't leave. It's, it's crazy what's happening there. So uh, this is, uh, before you find yourself in the position that someone in Australia is right now, uh, you know, know that this is game time and you need to get yourself ready. And crypto is a big part of all this, of course. Um, and we can talk about it. So let's do no. it. No, uh, no, yeah, and, and I love where it's, where you're taking us because it's it's of the time and it is now. I, I agree. We can we can explain the the merits of Austrian School of Economics. We can go through, and I will repeat the signal as well. The importance of crypto and the new emerging currencies and markets. But again, I think your first point is is on the night. We must get right within ourselves, and we must look to ourselves and support ourselves. I I see that no no. No clearer than I have seen it today when I watched Max Egan on the, the Crow House and I see how Mac, how defeated and deflated Max kind of felt. And Max always tries to aspire and inspire to, to bring the good vibration, to, to keep that, to keep us in that, in that good zone of a good vibration to be admitting and, not, and to not let negative vibrations uh, absorb us because it will only bring us to dark places in our mind, but it impacts you physically as well to allow yeah. the dread. To, to allow the dread and the fear to assume you and what you need to do, as you say, what we have all been doing is to prepare. And what does that entail? Whatever you can and you have at your disposal, 
to make your life a little bit more easier going forward, to avoid and inform yourself of some of the possible pitfalls of primarily not partaking in the in the experiment that's being rolled out on a global scale, to prepare yourself financially as best as you can. And I have, not a man of great means, Rafa, but I have, through listening in, tucked away and got my treasure chest in order as much as I can and what I could do with that. Because I think that as a, as a technology, with the privacy kind of the FCC, put it into a cold storage, we can come back, we can, you know, as all things, maybe they do pass. Maybe this technocratic, this technocratic march might last a little bit longer than normal, normal communist sort of takeovers because this is ultimate control with technology and AI together. So it's a new, it is a new paradigm we're entering in humanity. It is of an epic importance and it's lost on a great swath of people. I get that. And as you say, we, can't, we cannot wake the sheep anymore. We must bring together ourselves and surround ourselves with lions and warriors, people that are self-sufficient as well and can offer trade, labor and services and skills that you might not have. But these people understand where we are, what we need to do as a group, in a group together. If you're stuck in Australia, if you're stuck in Austria, if you're stuck in Switzerland, Ireland will get to that level. Possible places may escape it. Maybe Mexico is the paradise. Maybe the Southern American states are the place to be. With the with El Salvador adopting bit, Bitcoin currency and and that as a as an as a as a uh, financial currency, uh, the possibilities of like Pakistan that mines its own Bitcoin, we can be we can become a producer of our own Bitcoin and control our wealth in, in ourselves and be a big player in that market should it emerge. But at this point in what I say, and I'm sorry to hug the mic, Raphael, it is a global war and it is out of each and every uh, our hands. So we must get right, as I would say as a Christian, get right with God, which means getting right with yourself. Draw that line in the sand, where you are, what you're going to do, and think functionally and practically what you need to do in your life and what you can do to prepare for, to give yourself the best possible chance. Rafa, back to you. No, yeah, 100%. Um, and so, you know, we have, we have these tools uh, that come forth from uh, the science of cryptography and mathematics that allow us to have more freedom. So now the, the, the know-how is what's important, right? And, and knowing how to use these accordingly. In some regards, you might find yourself in a place in the world where you, you're not surrounded by tyranny like people in Hong Kong are. Well, you maybe don't, don't need privacy coins, right? If you find yourself in a great place, but if you're in a if you're in an awful place like Hong Kong, maybe you do need privacy coins, right? So it's a uh, it's everyone's different. Everyone has different needs, and everyone has different skill levels. the The most important thing is to to understand that you get to tailor this to your own life, and so that's where we're at, and that's what we're about at the Crypto Vigilante. We teach people. Um, how to tailor this to their own life because this is not something that you can just paint with a broad brush and say the, this is what you need. No, this is these are different tools. They're all different, and you have to figure out what tools you need. Um, do you have any specific questions? I'm, I'm oh, yeah, talking no, about I, this. We go in I, many I, directions here. Not specific questions. I just want to kind of pick up off uh, on your last broadcast about what wealth gives you. It gives you space and time to think. And that's what we've been, what we have been missing, probably in our lives, because we, by design, have our nose to the grind, and we don't allow ourselves to uh, to explore in our mind the thinking and to 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 understand the the importance of critical thinking. Uh, that would probably would have averted all of this, but by design, that kind of aspect of of school education has been taken away. So to to go back, what my fr friend asked the question, my friend asked in basic terms, uh, when they were considering putting their wealth, what they had now to invest it into the cryptocurrency world. She asked me, uh, Mary's board asked me, what am I buying? Uh, and I said and repeated, well, I said, it's, it's digital scarcity. You're buying digital scarcity and it's akin to gold. But because of the Satoshi white paper, as I was just breaking it into it just as a diatribe, because of the white paper, because Bitcoin didn't adopt uh, privacy at the protocol level, that its, it's uh, utility was slowed down because of the high transaction costs now. But Pirate Chain gives it that. Let's install the, the advocacy or the, the benefits of Pirate Chain specifically because it is a, a top drawer technology. And I've had Lutz on and I've also had Dearth on from the community and I'm part of the community and I'm part of the, the good ship 
uh, pirate chain as well. So I want to right. extol the benefits of that and the fungibility aspect, how we can be used peer to peer, what we can use, sorry, last bit, how we can use in our community to trade and use that tool to give ourselves a, a flow of a flow of money. Okay, well, yes, um, I, I'm of the school of thought that um, Bitcoin was perfect in its design. Um, Bitcoin was perfect in, in, in its design, but it, Bitcoin was never supposed to be perfect money, perfect digital money. And a lot of us recognize that in the early days. And those that were, in my opinion, most honest regarding this desire of having perfect money went off and developed and created what we now have to be uh, Monero. Monero is, in my opinion, everything uh, Bitcoin from a Bitcoin BTC maximalist desires Bitcoin to be, right? Digital gold, digital cash. Now, yes, uh, Monero is something that we trust a lot because it's it's cryptography that is has been peer-reviewed for a lot longer. And so... Peer, uh, in, when it comes to like privacy coins, Monero is number one on the planet because it it is a technology that is most peer reviewed. Now, Pirate Chain is very good technology. It's just more advanced. It's newer technology that uh, provides pri for privacy. It provides privacy like Monero by default at the protocol level, but it's newer technology. Now, what does that mean? that it is arguably better, but it has not existed for as long amount of time for it to provide us with all of the necessary peer reviews that we can that we see in, in Monero at the present moment. So the heart of all this is trustlessness, right? That we need these protocols and, and to be protocols that everyone can uh, verify anywhere in the world at the same time. Um, Monero, since it's older technology, it has been peer reviewed more. A uh, pirate chain, since it's newer technology, has been peer reviewed less. So we are in the process of helping the pirate chain community um, evolve. It's still uh, it's new. It's still growing. Um, it's it hasn't been as peer reviewed as Monero. But you are you are. You were one of the first to advocate for a proof of works and uh, to kind of pull the reins on the pirate chain because they want to evolve, as you say, like the BSV. They want to be an arco with it and evolve super quick. And they've come out with a new casino and it's a new a new way of uh, spending the war kind. I was talking about war as well. Bitcoin, Bitcoin um, sorry, pirate chain being wrapped in a token and the aspect of that. Well, again, I'm trying to lead my audience to that. There's a whole range of new tools, atomic swaps, NFTs new technologies that you can trade, uh, you could use for mortgages, you could you could stamp a car with a token ID number and that would officially be yours. That would be the contract of buying and purchasing. But uh, the whole ethos of cryptocurrency is, is to decentralize, is to get away what is encroaching now, which is ultimately more centralized control, centralized banking, centralized medicine, uh, and all of, all of that that goes in tow. So this is where we're probably planting seeds for the understanding of uh, ultimate privacy with ultimate capitalism, the free market. It's not a bad right. place and it can self-govern itself. It doesn't need government interference. Right. So Monero has been um, the privacy coin in cryptocurrency, the, the gold standard of privacy coins. And so when Pirate Chain came around, it was like the um, new kid on the block and it proposed even greater privacy than Monero. And and objectively, the technology does promise for it to, ha you know, have the potential of being more private than Monero. But since it's newer, it hasn't been peer reviewed as much. So yes, I was one of the first ones, and probably the only one uh, that actually, yeah, I, I don't know of anyone else that was advocating for peer reviewed audits um, in Pirate Chain. And I just so Pirate Chain, I've always seen it as um, in an accelerationist network where people want to build fast. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to build fast, but there comes a time when, you know, we want to, okay, slow down a little. And so I said to the Pirate Chain community, I'm like, we love what you guys are doing, but it's time, you know, I think that we should focus on some peer-reviewed audits. And they have. And, and so part of what they're building with, like, the casino that you're talking about and other ways to monetize is for them to create 
uh, a, a, a source of funds so that they can invest on their audits, which I think is great. Um, I think it's great that they're using, that they're um, figuring things out and, and how to source the capital necessary to pay for these audits. Now these audits for uh, zero knowledge proofs are expensive uh, because there's not a lot of people on the planet that understands this level of cryptography. Um, some cryptographers, and I, I would name like Ian Grigg a couple months ago um, in Berlin, no, pardon me, in Zug, Switzerland, he said, um, he referred to zero knowledge proofs as an exotic form of cryptography. So it, when you have actual like world renowned cryptographers telling you that zero knowledge proofs is something considered exotic, you pay attention, right? This is not something that, not, this is not something that at its heart, everyone understands. And it's for that, for that reason, it is exactly for that reason that in my opinion, we need these audits, right? Because we need to trust these technologies. So in order to trust them, we need to make sure that they are um, being verified by by people that does do understand these technologies that are you know not at all involved with the project. And so the pirate chain community is doing that, and and we're very happy to see them moving along in this direction. As you say, it's a form of peer review, and it just it strengthens the trust in the technology. We get that, and I, I say I, I I fear that we're we're veering off a little bit, a little bit too technical. I can see some of the comments here as well, and you can see the comments there on the screen, Rafa. If you press on the comments rather than the private chat, okay. Uh, well, if you want to take, if you want to interact there with any of the with the guests over on the, don't forget it's it's a Derpa operated the Zook book there on that one. <laughs> but we do have D live, and we're also broadcasting live on Odyssey, and I am I'm in the okay. the. the I'm trying to promote people to get off these platforms. And since we were deleted off YouTube to find us here in the alternative medias again, and that again is another aspect of, uh, of blockchain and its technology odyssey, where I'm all my back catalog of all my YouTube videos, four years worth taken down are there and they are on the blockchain and they cannot be removed because I hold the key to the channel. And again, another tool to, to thwart censorship. Right on. But it needs, oh, but it needs yeah. mass adoption, pretty much like the cryptocurrency. It needs people to not only understand the technologies, but put their trust and faith in it. So you know, there, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I, I personally think that my that the killer app in all of crypto is entrepreneurship. Yeah, and yeah, we can talk about that. That's really what geeks me out even more than privacy. Yeah, yeah. I honest. wanted, I want to get back there as well. Yeah, entrepreneurship. Uh, as you say, when I said like the big. Big block uh, Bitcoin miners, when they mine, you, as you keep saying and you advocate, you have the power to compete with the Googles, the Facebooks. You have that whole enterprise. But I don't think people can you can you kind of uh, extrapolate a little bit more on how people can use these tools to compete with the Googles, to compete with the Facebook. They can they have that entrepreneurial space where they can come up with a a, a business model, a model, and then they have all these tools at their disposal to put their their. Um, their creation into into life in essence, put their business into into real world. Yes. Yeah. So so pretty much um, the way that Bitcoin was created in its original design is that you could use the miners at the back end of your business. As simple as that. So you don't have to worry about having a database or infrastructure to to scale your startup. You can just create a front end and use the Bitcoin miners as the back end of your business. As simple as that. And and so. In my opinion, this is what really like bothered the the controllers of the internet and those who control innovation, big tech, and Silicon Valley, and they did not want this to get out. So they created an atmosphere within crypto where now we have we had a civil war within Bitcoin, and we had the you no know, small blockers, big blockers. It was the big blockers like myself that said, "No, you can use the Bitcoin uh, blockchain as." the new internet. So Bitcoin is, for us big blockers, is the new internet, where every data packet that is sent on this new internet is a tiny microtransaction, where just like when we communicate via signal or using PGP encryption or anything like that, every transaction can be encrypted. You can also encrypt messages on this new internet called Bitcoin. So it's understanding that Bitcoin is the understanding that Bitcoin is a new internet. This new internet right now is is has the most transactions uh, than more almost any other 
blockchain. Yeah, more than any blockchain in the world, and that's BSV. BSV that's Bitcoin's in its that's Bitcoin in its original design, where we understand that miners are the center of the network and the most important entities of the network. Now, you look at the price of BSV right now. You see it, how BSV is uh, devalued by the market. Well, to me, that's just that's that's par for the course. I'm expecting that because Bitcoin in its totality and its original design is something that has gotten attacked immensely. And in my opinion, it's the number one threat to the establishment. And so this is the reason for why I see BTC being something that now depends on institutional money because they created something that depends on second layers that depends on institutional money for it to even function as digital cash. And even if they wanted to use that logical argument, then I would tell them that um, Monero is actually what they really desire. Monero was the group of BTC developers and group of, of BTC enthusiasts that wanted to do that with Bitcoin, but realized that they had to do it correctly from scratch. And that's how we got Monero, right? So. Um, I really like Monero. I love Monero. I love Pirate Chain. But I, if I, if you were to ask me about Bitcoin, what really geeks me out is Bitcoin's original design at scale. And we're seeing it right now. It's doing over 700,000 transactions per second. BTC's doing seven transactions per second. So, I mean, that goes to show that we were right, that you can scale Bitcoin in its original form. And that you can, all, all the legacy and most you know famous applications of the internet, like Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, that's all be, we, we, that's all been created on Bitcoin's original design. And the YouTube is Streamanity. We have there's even a um, an exchange, a crypto exchange on BSV called TDXP. Uh, there's Twitch, which is like the yeah, I have that. To Twitter. Yeah. There's also um, Bitcloud. Relica. Yeah. Have you Relica. Heard, that have you heard Bitcloud. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of so what entrepreneurs do in this new internet is that they leverage off each other's um, success, and it's beautiful because the more you use this new internet, the cheaper thing transactions are, which is unlike Ethereum and it's unlike BTC. So whether you like B BSV or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is, is that there's this new option, that there is this option in the market as a new internet that was given to us by Satoshi and that we knew was possible, that we fought for it to be alive. It's still alive, it's not dead. It's, mm. it's the most used blockchain in the planet. So I, we don't care how much it is being valued in the market at the present moment because what we see is something bigger. We see something that um, look, you, you think that privacy coins are, the, are what are more attacked in the world of crypto and they're not, what's more attacked is Bitcoin's original design. And that to me is crazy. Really? So it goes to show, it goes to show that there's something there. There is something there. And you, you have to go back to Satoshi's white paper and again, his original intent. And it seems that Bitcoin got to step one, two, uh, maybe as far as three, but out of a possible say 11 steps, it didn't go any further than that. And it stayed at step two or three, and it, and it, and its full utility, as you say, hasn't been realised, and that's been again probably 100%. be by design. They wanted to get it out there, but I want to bring it back to you again: is the Bitcoin tribalism, is the BTC, the BSV, and those competing trains of thoughts? There, BTC seems to be going out for the lightning rod to try and bring in its its level of privacy and control, whereas BSV, as you say, and and I and I know these these uh. These anacronyms for some of our guests are a little bit there, but it's 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 as a matter of record, it's there recorded, and you can listen through the conversation again, and you will understand the abbreviations like BTC, BSV, these these competing um, trains of thought, shall we say, in Bitcoin. <clears throat> what would we get if we could get the Bitcoin community to work in unity and say progress past steps three, four, five, and six? What kind of utility do you think Bitcoin's full application could bring to the world? So um, I think that. What we're going to realize in the future is, is that all these three chains, these sibling chains of Bitcoin are going to enter into a symbiotic relationship with one another. And that's because at the heart, we have the Bitcoin miners that mine across all, the, all of these three chains. 
And these miners are pretty agnostic. These miners are going for what is most profitable in the present moment. And all of these chains are competing for their future business. So yeah, at this present moment, BTC is the number one. It has the brand recognition. Is is the is the chain that kept the t- the first ticker symbol that became very popular. Um, actually, the first ticker symbol was XBT, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so this was this is something that is um, um, this is something that's not going to stop. It's it's something that we're showing miners right now, and we're showing entrepreneurs what's possible on Bitcoin's original design. The only thing that Bitcoin any of the Bitcoin chains cannot do is provide us privacy by default at the protocol level, like Monero and Pirate Chain can. So, so definitely, if you were to be speaking to someone about what is Satoshi's real intent and his desire for Bitcoin to be, you're going to get different opinions as to what that intent or desire for Bitcoin to have been. Some some Monero advocates would say that what Bit, what Satoshi really wanted was Monero, and they yeah. would point to some of his writings and say, "Well, you know what? This is what Satoshi really wanted." I personally think Satoshi was a team, a team of individuals that uh, had different ideas, and there was some people in that team that were more influential than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there was a clash of ideas and in team satoshi and that was manifested with the bitcoin civil war and you know when you when you once okay so you have the original satoshi team right satoshi puts out the white paper once it's launched we can't really talk about i see i, I always think of satoshi as a team of people yeah no matter like who your team that, it doesn't matter who was part of the beginning of the launch of Bitcoin, but once Bitcoin is launched, we're all part of the team. So the conversations that were being had in within Team Satoshi and those debates that they were having, those different outlooks as to what cryptocurrency is for, what what is it about, was augmented. And now we were having that conversation. We were Team Satoshi, all of us, everyone watching this. Now everyone's Team Satoshi. And everyone has a different, you know, personal preference regarding privacy. There's people that live in very tyrannical places that the first thing that they think about is privacy. There's people that live in beautiful places on the planet that they don't, their knee-jerk reaction is not for privacy, but their knee-jerk reaction is to create something that's beautiful, something that's capitalistic. Then there's people that maybe have a socialist understanding of the world which is wrong in my opinion, but they might think in terms of that and they might want to create something that is that fits their narrative. But the beautiful thing about Bitcoin and what was created was that it created a global free market where we can actually compete with these ideas. And built within Bitcoin itself is an economic engine that we call the Nakamoto consensus. And this is excluding all the altcoins, including Pirate Chain and Monero. The, the Nakamoto consensus within Bitcoin itself revolves around that which is most profitable for the network in general. Starting f- first and foremost with the miners. Decisions that have been made by miners up until this present moment are decisions that are not necessarily economically based, but are decisions that have been politically driven. What do I mean? What I mean is, is that the Satoshi, when Satoshi launched Bitcoin, when Team Satoshi launched Bitcoin, they they launched it with an emissions schedule that was supposed to, in my opinion, kickstart the network, create a, an economic incentive structure built within it so that miners have an incentive to protect the network. But that wasn't supposed to be the only way for miners to monetize in Bitcoin. In the early days, we would always talk about the golden age of mining. And the golden age of mining was that time when Bitcoin transaction fees were more profitable than the block reward itself. So what happened? What happens is that we had the civil war. And in my opinion, it's because the powers that be got scared of the fact that we were going to take the power of innovation away from them yeah. with this new internet called Bitcoin. So mm. they skewed the incentive structures in Bitcoin and we fought for it. 
um, where miners are no longer the center of the network and where uh, transactions that are processed between miners are limited, right? Because if they're limited to, to one megabyte, then you no longer can transact many transactions. And if the, if, if the block size is limited, then you can't do microtransactions, which right away, what does that do? Slows it, it down. It, it slows us down. It, 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 and, it, and, and they, and then reorganize the incentive structures of That's transactions right. process. So now they created this thing called re replaced by fee, which is an auction process in the BTC blockchain where people have to literally auction, you know, go get into an auction and pay their way into the next by paying. It's about creating fees. an incentive and a building structure like uh, like the default payment system on Parachain to go back there is. 0 0.003, it's my it's microscopic, so it, it can happen instantaneously and it allows smaller blocks to go quickly. So you can have that instantaneous transaction on the blockchain peer to peer without that third party, without the Whereas, bank in essence being involved. Right on. Whereas in Bitcoin's original design, transactions were processed not through that auction process of replace by fee, but transactions were processed by first come, first taken by the by the by the blockchain by the by the miners. First come, first serve, right? Why is that? Because if you have an unbonded block size and you can, and the blocks can scale as market demands, then what ends up happening is, is that you have what we always understood for there to be in the Nakamoto consensus an economy of scale. That the more that you use the blockchain, the more you use the miners, the Bitcoin miners, the cheaper the transaction fees are. And we're proving that on Bitcoin SV. How are we proving that? Well, look at the transaction fees. We're now talking of things that are less than microtransactions, we're talking about nano transactions. So we're moving beyond a Satoshi, we're moving to, we call them Duros. Duros, like, wow. like really tiny, tiny, tiny dust of transaction fees. Why is that? It's just, that's just how economies of scale work. If you yeah. have a joint and you start selling pizzas for the first time, you might have to charge quite a bit for your first pizzas because you, know, you, have, to, you have to cover your costs. But let's say tomorrow you start selling thousands of pizza a day, you can lower the cost of your pizzas and still provide a good product while covering your costs. And that's exactly what's happening with Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin's original design, we can finally see that in the future, we can have an economy on chain. In BTC, you can't have an economy on, cha on chain. I'm sorry, you just can't. It, no longer can you have an economy on chain. You may want to, but you can't. I'm sorry. You won't ever be able to because you you literally crippled the miners on BTC. And so what what's left is a second layer that at this moment, um, I find the Lightning Network to be extremely something they have to be very cautious with. Why is that? Because there is no way to actually route transactions without it being centralized. There are these things called watchtowers that um, that that. Are, are needed to exist within the Lightning Network to oversee the routing of transactions within the Lightning Network. And why is that? It, because the Lightning Network was created for the purpose of creating more privacy within BTC transactions. Why is that? Because you couldn't do that within the Bitcoin BTC tra Bitcoin transactions without a second layer. That's what they thought. But see, there's some deception there, and I'll explain to it, I'll explain it to you in a second. The, since the Lightning Network is a, a mesh network of different nodes that are connected to each other via cryptographic signatures, there is a problem in that since, you, since these hubs can be anonymous, any of these hubs could possibly be an enemy that could Sybil attack or attack your transaction. And there is an economic incentive to do so because they're trying to mimic the way the, ar the architecture of the internet functions at in this day, right? That there's different mm -hmm. layers within the internet. That, that was their whole argument. Okay. But people hack each other in the internet for information, right? And we're just transacting information. Now imagine if we were if we had the same similar infrastructure as the internet, but we, we were transacting things of value, actual, you know, currency, digital currency via the Lightning Network, well, there's definitely an incentive structure for you to, for people to do something malicious and they hide as a node, a privacy node within the Lightning Network and attack your transaction. 
and Sybil attack the network. So the Lightning Network right now functions via centralized liquidity. So Lightning Network companies like Strike, for example, in El Salvador are, trans are moving money via the Lightning Network, but they are the central hub. So it became a hub and spokes network, a hub and spokes, right? Like a wheel, right? A hub and spokes network, because now they can they can have transactions routed in a way that's safe, right? Yeah. But, but now you just lost that centralization. So what did we do there? I mean, literally what they did was create, in my opinion, like a new PayPal. So, so the Lightning Network still has a long way to go. I just want to, I want to, I want to break that down. So what that means, PayPal, and then and what we're going to do, PayPal is essence, what people are doing now and what people are, are breaking into the cryptocurrency market is they're using and they're seeing the convenience of PayPal where you can supposedly buy Bitcoin on their ecosystem, but you're buying a paper transaction. You're not actually holding the Bitcoin. They hold the key. They hold the Bitcoin. You don't own the Bitcoin if you don't own the key. Uh, we we kind of went really deep there, particularly for my audience as well. They were kind of ours, and I get and I get it. Part, uh, what I want to finish off here in the last ten or fifteen minutes, uh, Rafa. And again, thanks very much for jumping in there. And that was that particular section that we just did was for the BTC community who will be jumping in. In essence, we're wanting to hear because uh, Rafa has just been advocating not only for BSV because of the micro t the transactional fee going down down to the duo duo level, even like the pew pews. That kids are using now for our microtransactions on the gaming in the gaming world and all that, and for privacy I, too, which is section ten of the white paper, and that's something oh, really? that I, I didn't. Section ten of the white paper tells you that you're able to have a, a, a large degree of privacy on Bitcoin's original design, but in order to do that, to be able to have that, is you have to have microtransactions, and so since since you can't have microtransactions on BTC, you cannot enjoy the benefits of section 10 of the white paper yeah no it's a bit i don't think i can't see in my lifetime or our lifetime we'll ever get back to a stage where we can introduce those those protocol levels and and really speed up btc because you said the power is there so that's where we're having to depend on these alt alternative technologies that kind of run to where btc used to be what, what, no, what I, btc really wants to be it's called monero so yeah, monero yeah. is really what btc and bitcoin cash really want to be but BTC because had a glitch, or Monero had a glitch just gone by there. They've, 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 there was a, a weakness at the at the post scale of the Monero. There was a supposed weakness. So that kind of scuppers it and will put people off, no? Because they no, see no. The... We, we wrote about this uh, last month at the Crypto Vigilante. No, it's it's something that just affects a very, very like small amount of, of, of wallets. And when they're attached to an exchange and it's probablistic and it's like 0.00001% of transactions so it's, it's minuscule. All, all it means is, is that you just have to know how to use Monero. If you want to understand Monero, and this is something that actually has been spoken about in the Breaking Monero series in the past. So uh, go on YouTube and, and look up Breaking Monero. Uh, it's a whole series, and all of this is already, this has been known, this has been spoken about in the past. Does a I, I think I'll finish it up on this as well, Raphael, because and I, and it's the last question and it's one consistent question and a criticism of sure. Pirate Chain and you might be able to round it up. And I hope you don't, it's it's not me dropping a bomb here or anything, but it's something that I am asked if I, if I come in contact with any of the Pirate community is there's a suspicion that I'll, like over 90% of it has been mined previously or already and that we're only competing after the small 10%. How would you answer that? Because I know the community I mean, at large the same, the is same argument, the same, same, to, same type of arguments were made of Bitcoin when it launched. Mm -hmm. well, it's not fair that the miners that first mined Bitcoin have the majority of the Bitcoin. The same argument was made for Monero. You mm -hmm. know, the Monero kicks in its tail in emission in like 2024, like mm -hmm. just in a couple of years. So over 80% yes. of all Moneros are already mined. I mean, if you want to logically keep going in that direction now, um, pirate chain, pirate chain is 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 an accelerationist coin, and they wanted to catch up in development with Monero. They want to compete with Monero. Okay, great, compete with them. And one of their tactics in order to speed up development is to incentivize its user base by having a fast emission schedule. That's fine. 
if you don't like the fast emission schedule of pirate train, you don't have to use it. Doesn't mean that you're, you know, like it doesn't, this, this is all voluntary. All these cryptocurrencies are voluntary. I don't see anything wrong with it. Personally, I I find it to be an anti-capitalist argument to critique the emission schedule. It's all, it's, it's just, it's critic. you know, are you mad at Satoshi for having over a million Bitcoin? I'm not. I'm actually really happy you gave us this gift, you know? Still, still so, claimed. You know, the first investors are those who take the greatest risk, right? So it's really easy to, to talk about something once it's popular and to critique it and to, and, and it's, it's really simple. But if you didn't do the legwork, you know, those who actually invested their time and energy in creating something that is world changing merit the 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 rewards of their initial investment and, I agree. and no no one's telling you that you have to invest in pirate chain if anything this conversation i just told you the positive my job is to be objective as an analyst so if pirate chain or monero ever mess up i'm going to be the first guy in the world to call them out me this guy right here that's my job and so a, a, a cryptocurrency community may love me one day, but then they might hate me the next day. That doesn't, I, I don't care. I'm here for my subscribers and my, our team is here for our subscribers. And we're here to tell you guys what we think. Here's a disclaimer along these lines. My opinions on Bitcoin belong to me because not everyone in my team and we, I, and we chose our team carefully for it to be not a sounding board or people guys that like, agree with me on everything we all agree on we agree on pirate chain we agree on monero we agree on those things that that are most important in our opinion for you as an individual but when it comes to bitcoin most of the guys on the crypto vigilante team are on the other side they're most on the of the worldview of btc some Mm. like i think jeff berwick is he he's always been a little partial to he's very He's been a little partial to Bitcoin Cash, but I've been the one that's been BSV all the way, yeah, and true. and I've I've yet to be convinced otherwise that I find so much value in Bitcoin's original design that I just can't keep myself from talking about it. <laughs> I, I see can. that as really a little fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I, it's hope, okay. I hope it catches fire. I hope it catches fire the BTC because I do realize that there there is. It's an untapped, another level of untapped resource. And I'll make no apologies now as well, Rafa. I'm completely geeking off here and being really selfish with our audience as well because I'm thoroughly fascinated by this. And I know some people won't be, won't be, won't be getting it anyway, but I think it's important that some of these points are clarified for the wider community just to answer some of these criticisms as well. And, and I think it's perfect. Sure. Look, I, I'd love to invite you back now. We're coming up on the golden hour and I've taken up far too much of your time. And I would probably sit here and, and have a couple of scoops with you and we'd carry on talking all night long, but I know your time is, is uh, short and your time is precious. And I want to thank you for um, giving up your time to me here specifically and coming to the audience. Just, I know it gets a little bit technical, but it's there as a matter of record and people can go and review it. Quick shout out to what you see as a, a as a, a good a emerging technology that you're really excited about. I know we had our, our kind of listing there and another kind of coin that came up like that, but something you might throw out to an Irish audience to uh to uh, entice us with getting into crypto gosh i really like like emerging technology i know that's a surprise kind of kind of broad well, I Useful. Can't, so, I, there's some that i can't talk about yeah i get that now you can but, talk to me but, after but, the show you can talk to me <laughs> after the show on that one <laughs> well i i think i think um i really like darrow and what they're attempting to do Dero is like the privacy uh, Ethereum. I I think that they're onto something huge. That if entrepreneurs under, understand what Dero is proposing to the market, it could be a game changer in ways that I, at this moment I can't even fathom. Um, where is it at? Where is it at in the market, uh, Rafael? Rafael, where is it at in the market? I, I do fundamental analysis. So I'm gonna you not make I'm gonna have to look it up for you actually because <laughs> I, I I look man the way I see crypto is is that and this is the way that pretty much we all see crypto in, in my um with my crew um fundamental analysis is more important than technical analysis and so what does that mean that you have to understand the intrinsic makeup of of these coins first and foremost 
right? You really have to understand them from within. And then once you understand them from within, then you can be at ease that when you are investing in something, you're not just, you know, um, willy dilly throwing your heart you're out of yeah. Yeah, you're not you're not gambling. So when I when we do research on something, we find something that's solid. We don't worry about the price as much. I mean, obviously, we have the best technical analysts in the world, guys that have been charting Bitcoin. We're the first ones. Our guys were the first ones in the world to chart Bitcoin in the Bitcoin talk forums in 2010. I say it. I know. I know, Mister Mister Royce. I say I know the names in the team. It's fantastic. Yeah. Papi, so, so this is Darrow, and Darrow right now is trading at twelve dollars and seventy nine cents. D E R O. That nice. is the privacy Ethereum. So, what Pirate Chain is to Bitcoin, Darrow is to Ethereum. There you go. That's, That's Darrow a good cue. Uh, I'll get that. I think, Raphael. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to speak with you soon. Thank you very much for great to talk. Thank to you me for having well. me. Appreciate and it. And we talk soon. And uh, look at yourself going forward and, uh, you know, do what you got to do. And thank you for your wise words and your, your words there at the very start there. It's time to look within. It's time to get, it's time to start uh, rounding up all of us nearest and dearest. Rafa, take care. God bless. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Financial slavery is a bitch because it doesn't let you think. That's the whole point. Don't give you time to think. If you want to really learn philosophy, you need leisure. Leisure. Crypto is here to give you the leisure so you can think.